what's up everybody thanks for tuning in hope you guys are doing well today we're going to be talking about another episode of american indians uh, being enslaved sent to plantations sent to the caribbean uh, before that i wanted to go ahead and remind everybody about previous videos uh, regarding the same subject uh, we've gone over many uh, references primary sources historical records showing how much, how big Indian slavery was in the Americas. And who were they really enslaving when they really got here? So we've gone over this information many ways. Um, this is my playlist right here. If you're new to my channel, or if you haven't been able to go back and catch up to uh, the previous presentations, this is one of my series, most popular series, I would say. It's uh, from indigenous American to African American. And um, this is part one, of course, but we have like 20 parts of this. In this series, we do get to the part where we're talking about the Indian slavery. So you can go right to part 12. As it says here, your conquest and enslavement, genocide, that's the name right there. Part 14, transatlantic slave trade in reverse. Part 15, the French enslavement of the American Indian, Couriers de Bois. All right, you guys remember that? Part 16, Processes of enslavement, POWs, not ADOs. Part 17, POWs, not ADOs, indentured service. All right, we start going into the indentured servitude. Part 18, the illegal beginning of American Negro slavery. Part 19, 1619, indentured servants, not slaves. Part 20, first Negro slaves, Indians, in 1526. I also want to remind everybody, uh, about the ancestry DNA test kits uh, videos we've shown that clearly that you know it's all entertainment it's not real science you know if you go enough DNA then you're not really doing the right thing when it comes to trying to find your ancestors you know you gotta do your genealogy not spit in the tube this is false all right we got this one let me be a free man King Philip Metacomets uh, War, Pequot War, Indians sent to the Caribbean. We keep going. We got this one, which was a consolidation of uh, references of the Spanish and Portuguese. Who were they really enslaving? Uh, basically, that's the name of it. Who did the Spanish and Portuguese really enslave? Facts versus fiction. Alex Haley, Roots Hoax. All right, we went over that. We showed and proved that Roots the movie was plagiarized. It's a fictional movie. He had to go to court because he plagiarized a fictional book called The African. And he had to uh, pay a fine. He settled out of court and he lost, right? So the whole thing about Roots is it's a hoax. And as we keep going, we got this one, the Mata Musket, Machapunga, Indians, free people of color, lost row, no colony, declassification, huh? They're naming Indians, free people of color, right? We just saw the uh, Owatan video how they were uh, being declassified as well, tagged, uh, colored, 
just because they were living outside the reservation. And we got Pequot Indian slaves and crypto Puritans in Providence Island colony, African false narratives. All right, make sure you guys are going to go check this out if you haven't. Pearls and the American Indians, Temple of Tolomeco, Lucayan slave, pearl divers. Okay, great video, one of my favorites. Then we got Bensonis and De La Casa's account of American Indian servitude, orders of Charles V. A swarthy man, of course. The first slaves were not in 1619. A Leon expedition. And we got this video from Indians to Colored People. The Wepemelk, Chowan Nation. How they got declassified as well. And we got the Sigua, Mexica, Aztec warriors enslaved in Costa Rica and taken to Jamaica. These are Montezuma's. Uh, they used to go out and uh, look for gold and bring it up from Montezuma. And uh, they actually stayed in Costa Rica because uh, when the Spanish got there, they couldn't go back. So from there, they were eventually enslaved by the English and Mosquito tribe. Right? They were allied with the English and they were taking the Sigua. That's not their name. They were Aztec. And they were bringing them to Jamaica, into the plantations. And we got Virginia Indians, Racial Integrity Act, Free People of Color, Mulatto Slavery, Paper Genocide. All right? We go over what Walter Plecker did, if you don't know. Then we got my video over here, the truth about reclassification and erasure of American Indians on paper. All right, make sure you guys go ahead and check out all these uh, videos. Then, of course, we got the truth about Juneteenth. Arankawa and the Atacapa Indians, Sephardic pirate colonists, not Africans. And, of course, we got a recent video, again, Poetan Indians classified as free people of color. Possible origins in Mesoamerica, Hutun Maya. All right. So that should uh, help when it comes to really understanding or overstanding who was really getting enslaved and how many times those so-called Negroes that they were replacing the Indians or that they were bringing in were actually Indians. All right, I want you guys to understand that the numbers keep piling up. They're piling up and they're piling up. And I got another one today. And every time we read about a new tribe and learn about a new tribe, this is one of the tribes that never gets mentioned. You know, it's not part of the five civilized tribes. There's many, many tribes that we know we don't know about. Unless you're part of the ancestry or you live in the area where they might have been, you probably won't know about these people. So today we're going to talk about the Nancy Atico. Nancy Atico, right? To me, that's a little... Funny, not in a, you know, trying to make fun, but, uh, you know, in Costa Rica, we're called Ticos. That's like our nickname, you know, Tico. Everybody knows that. So it's when I saw this, I was like, hmm, interesting. The Nancia Tico Indians. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get into this book right away. It's called the Virginia Cavalcade. Um, this is volume 33. This is from spring of 1984, right? Issue four, volume 33, issue four again, if you guys want to look for it, the Virginia Cavalcade. All right, so I go to page 168 on this book, and on this chapter is called Sold into Slavery in Retribution Against the Nansiatico Indians by Gwenda Morgan. The arrival of Europeans in North America exacted a fearful toll of Indian lives as a result of war, massacre, famine, and disease. Nonetheless, Indians survived in significant though not large numbers on the Rappahannock River after permanent English settlement began there in the late 1640s. When old Rappahannock County was organized in 1656, they were living within its boundaries. At least four of the tribes that Captain John Smith had identified when he explored the river in 1608. The Moraticos, <laughs> the Moraticos, the Rappahannocks, the Nansiaticos, and the Mataponis, right? When Richmond County, then comprised in present-day Richmond, King George, and parts of Westmoreland counties, was created out of Old Rappahannock in 1692, only the Nansiatico tribe remained. The Nansiaticos had been one of the strongest tribes on the Rappahannock River, with at least 150 warriors in 1608. So real quick, because they were warriors, you're gonna see they got condemned something really bad happened to them and that's why today we don't know about this tribe that much 
you know, because they were warriors. These weren't the treaty-making Indians, if you get what I'm saying. They weren't making treaties with, <laughs> with the settlers. In 1669, after 20 years of regular contact with English settlers, the Nanciaticos were still reputed to have 50 warriors. And yet, at the beginning of the 18th century, the entire tribe scarcely numbered above 50 men, women, and children. Between 1704 and 1706, the government of colonial Virginia finally achieved what war, massacre, famine, and disease had failed to accomplish, the destruction of the Nanciatico Indians. Distrust of local Indians, desire for their land, all right, again, desire for their land, fear of distant Indians who harassed the frontiers, and suspicion of conspiracies among the different tribes were still deeply entrenched sentiments among white settlers in Richmond County at the beginning of the 18th century. So again, let's touch the hijack when we see white. Let's not forget everything we've learned. We know that just because it says white, this doesn't mean these are pale skin, what we consider white today, people. Most of these people in early Virginia especially 1600s, 1700s, most of these people, these colonists, these Europeans, these indentured servants were black folks, so-called Negroes too. So touch the hijack with white. The murder of planter John Rowley and his family in 1704, allegedly by Nanciatico Indians, all right? Allegedly. So they say allegedly furnished the county with the most spectacular trial in its colonial history and settled its account with the Indians once and for all. In 1704, the Nanciatico Indians had appealed to the Virginia General Assembly about encroachments on their diminishing resources. All right, so the Nanciatico Indians were bringing up these protests. They were trying to do it the right way. All right, I want to emphasize that they were they were trying to you know get the people that were supposedly in charge, right, the colonists who were forcing these people right to live in certain areas and you know trying to take their lands and all that they were trying to go by their rules and they didn't appeal say hey man your your people are messing with us what's up they've taken all our resources they're not respecting our land they charged thomas kendall of essex county with breaking down their fences and turning them off their land you see what he was doing others were claiming what was left of it the Indians did not seek the restitution of their property, but petitioned the assembly for a new land grant sufficient for their needs. The assembly ordered Attorney General Stevens Thompson to investigate their complaint and begin proceedings on behalf of the Indians if they were justified. But events soon overtook whatever help the Attorney General might have been able to render the tribe. So basically, they're not saying it here, basically they ignored them. You know, when you go read about this and other stories, Wikipedia or anything like that, it'll tell you just straight up that nothing happened when they brought up their appeal. They didn't get helped at all. So they didn't care about these people. So these people were desperate. Do you understand what it is to not be able to feed your child? Because somebody's taking all your resources, your land, you can't even hunt, you can't go fishing. What are you forced to do? What would you do? I'm asking you right now here, what would you do? On 12 of September, 1704, a letter from William Taylor, colonel of the Richmond County Militia, informed the council, hastily summoned together in Williamsburg, of the murder of Rowley and his family by Nancy Atico Indians. After ranging for several days, Taylor's militiamen tracked down the alleged murderers, right, alleged, and captured most of the tribe. So it seems like they condemned the whole tribe for a couple of people, right? Preliminary examination revealed evidence of a brutal, ritualized killing. On the day of the murders, some 10 Indian men and Jews had gathered at John Rowley's house in the upper part of the county at around 10 in the morning. Their bodies painted as if for war or sport. They had deceitfully inveigled their way into the house. They then killed Rowley, his wife, his wife's mother, and his son, and mutilated their bodies. Another child, a daughter, escaped. 
All right, so this is again all alleged. This is what they're saying. They found the bodies like that. We were supposed to believe this and everything. But also, did they have the reason to do this? I think they probably did. We don't know what these settlers were doing to, to their people. Fearful that this horrid and barbarous incident signaled the beginning of a new wave of Indian unrest, the council ordered the accused brought to Williamsburg for trial and confined Virginia's other local tributary Indians to their reservations. On the frontier, the council alerted the militia to expect trouble from fleeing Nanciaticos and their presumed allies on the Rappahannock River. Local settlers swooped down on the Nanciatico Indian town and destroyed it, carrying off skins, wampum, and other property belonging to the Indians. All right, so real quick, I just go to, to um, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources uh, website. They're talking about the Nanciatico Tico Indian town here, what they just mentioned in the book. Now, what we're going to learn is that this Indian town, this Nansatico Indian town became the Nansatico Plantation. Any field to the east of Nansatico Plantation House is the site of a village occupied by the Nansatico Indians. The village which was established in prehistoric times. All right. Do you guys hear that? Prehistoric times. Do you guys understand how old that is? How, old, how long these people have been here? The Nansatico Indian town. It was established in prehistoric times. It was one of the largest and most important Indian settlements on the Rappahannock in the early 17th century. The largest. So why don't we hear about this? It was similar to the village shown in Theodore de Bree's engraving in Thomas Harriet, a brief and true report of the newfoundland of Virginia in 1590. The name is a corruption of Nantaktakund, all right? This is their real name. They became known as the Nansatiko, but it was Nantaktakund, a tribal name originally identified by Captain John Smith. Although partial examination of the site has already uncovered significant artifacts from the Townsend and Potomac Creek components, complete archaeological investigation could provide important information on Indian life before and during the early contact period. So when we go to this link right here where it says nomination form PDF, right? We go to it <laughs> and it's this government document that has a lot of things crossed out, all right? But what I want to show is same thing we just read, more detailed. So the Nansatico archeological site is located in King George County, Virginia on the, and they crossed that out, not sure why, Rappahannock River, right? And they crossed this out so you don't know where it is. They don't want you to go find it. First identified in 1972. And it tells you all the stuff they're finding here, which was very important because it helped identify how the in, these people were living in, in, in many different periods of time. I want to go to this part right here. It says, also present at Nansatiko are lithic artifacts spanning the entire archaic period from 8,000 to 1500 BC. Listen, from 8000 BC, 8000 BC, that's 10,000 years ago, guys. There's people living here, right? Since prehistoric times. Ancestors supposedly of the Nansatiko people, as well as ceramic and lithic artifacts from the early Middle Woodland period from 1500 BC to 980. All right, so I just wanted to go ahead and show you guys this. When they were just talking about the Indian towns, you guys can get a reference about this Nansatiko Indian town. It was there for thousands of years, thousands of years. And I'm gonna show you what happened to these people. So again, on the frontier, the council alerted the militia to expect trouble from fleeing Nansiaticos and their presumed allies on the Rappahannock River. Local settlers swooped down on the Nansiatico Indian town, right? This, this town that's been there since prehistoric times, we just read, and destroyed it. They destroyed it, something that was there since prehistoric times, and they destroyed it. Who? The settlers. These are not just white people, right? All skin folk and kin folk. Carrying off skins, wampum, and other property belonging to the Indians. But there were no further incidents. 
The Indians remained quiet. The council therefore issued a special commission to have the trial of eight Nunciatico Indians charged with the crime held at the Richmond County Courthouse rather than at the general court in Williamsburg. Nevertheless, this was no ordinary case. The council ordered four of its members to attend the trial, along with the Speaker of the House of Burgesses, senior members of the neighboring county courts of Westmoreland, Stafford, and Essex, all the justices of Richmond County, and the clerks of all four counties. Also ordered to attend were the senior officers of each of the four county militias. These were to advise the members of the special court on what should be done with the rest of the tribe and any Indians who might be acquitted. The members of the special court and the militia officers were to submit their joint recommendations to the council. Also ordered to attend the trial were the interpreters of the Pamunkey, the Chickahominy, the Nottoway, the Meherring, and Nassimon Indians. So you see who was there present? on these people's trial, the other tribe's trial, why are they there? Together with two or three of the great men of each tribe, this was to be a show trial. You hear that? Early in October, 16 judges heard the case against the Nanciaticos, two rather than four counselors, Robert Carter and John Smith, and Speaker of the House of Burgesses, Peter Beverly, sat in judgment against the accused. Other members of the court were William Taylor, Francis Wright, John Catlett, George Taylor, Samuel Peachy, William Underwood, Alexander Donovan, John Dean, David Gwynn, John Tarpley, Thomas Beale, William Robinson, and Joshua Davis. Did many videos reading a book called The Jews and Muslims of British Colonial America, showing that these colonists, a lot of these names were in that book showing you their ethnicity showing you how they were really a lot of them Sephardic and Moorish Jews crypto Jews crypto Muslims Protestants Huguenots things like that so make sure to catch up to those uh, videos as well though the Indians pleaded not guilty the jury decided against them on 5th of October the court sentenced five of the accused old master Thomas bearded Jack Jack the Fiddler you hear that Jack the Fiddler this is the real Jack the Fiddler <laughs> Tom Anthony and George to be hanged. They hanged. Who were they hanging, huh? Who were they hanging? The 1920s. Who were they hanging? Nothing's changed, right? The sentence was carried out at once, right away. So as soon as they got charged, they went right outside. They hung them. Two others, Long Tom and Young Toby, both of whom pleaded guilty were also sentenced to die, although the court urged their reprieve because they had given evidence against their fellow tribesmen. They had snitched, huh? Did they beat them and force them to plead guilty and also snitch? For some reason, this is starting to sound like the Tituba Salem witch trials to me. Somebody being forced, right? One Indian, Frank, was acquitted. What was now to be done with the 40 or so remaining members of the tribe still in custody and under heavy guard? Why are these people so threatened by the rest of the tribe? Why are they so threatened by these people? Remember, these are warriors. These are not treaty signing Indians. The militia officers proposed a drastic solution. They resurrected an old Virginia law that, when a settler was murdered, made the Indians of the nearest town answerable for the crime with their lives or liberties. You hear that? They recommended that the surviving Indians be tried according to this act, first introduced in 1663, and if found guilty, transported out of the colony. All right, I want to remind everybody, that's exactly what we went over in those videos that I was showing you guys earlier in my series from Indigenous American to African American. We read some very good scholarly, educational, primary sources telling us this we're reading all the things that were going on at that time you know a lot of this stuff again is just excuses to move these indians out of the way really especially the ones that are not complying or signing treaties so what happened what were they thinking of doing transporting the whole tribe out of the colony this course of action they assured the council 
would promote the future peace, quiet, and security of Virginia and meet the particular satisfaction of the inhabitants of these parts. So they're like, yeah, we'll finally be able to take over their land and nobody's going to resist or fight us. And we already got the other Indians on our side and making treaties with us. The council agreed and the hapless Indians were passed from one set of county authorities to the next until they reached the colonial capital. There lodged in a public jail, they endured the winter in captivity. Do you hear that? All right, so real quick, <laughs> talking about treaty making Indians or friendly, so-called friendly Indians. Friendly to who? To the settlers. One of those nations is the Akamaki Indians. And this is not me telling you. I've done the video showing you uh, one of the persons that from this tribe, the lady. She knows who she is. Um, she actually came at me. You know, she has come at me and she says that I ruined all her years of research because of uh, the black European uh, videos that I did. So she's not in total agreement that there was black Europeans. You know, some people just want to be Indian and that's it. And, you know, it's funny because look what it says here. The true history of Virginia Indians says the Akamaki Indians are the friendliest first people of America. They have a history of being the American Indians who went above and beyond to assist the Jamestown settlement. The Akamaki people are a kingdom of people who originate and reside on what today is known as the Delmarva Peninsula of Virginia, better known as Virginia. All right, but what I wanted to say, emphasize is this is their website and they're letting you know because they know their history. They know what they their people did and who they allied with. <laughs> they have a history of being the American Indians who went above and beyond to assist the Jamestown settlement. They helped. They helped. They helped the settlers. There is a book written in 1911 by William Cropper entitled G Kingdom of Akamaki. All right, so we read that book actually in my Anthony Johnson video. Anthony Johnson, the first real slave master in America who actually held somebody in bondage or chattel for the first time. That was a black man on another so-called black man. All right, and um, the Johnsons happen to be related uh, to a lot of the Akamaki, like a lot of people who are Johnson go back to Akamaki, all right? So it makes sense to me when I read this, right? <laughs> so I'm not here coming at anybody. I'm just telling you the truth history, whether it's good, ugly, or bad. We have to know the whole thing to understand what really happened. And we do have to accept, you know, what our ancestors, what role they took, all of them, not just the Indians, not just the Europeans, all of them. The good ones, the bad ones, that's just history, and it's in the past. This is their own word saying, the Akamaki Indians were so friendly that when approached by the Pumanki Indians to supply poisonous plants to murder the Jamestown colonists, they refused. Do you hear them admitting that they sold out? There's no other way for me to like kind of say it. The Pumanki came to them so they can help them get rid of the colonists. And they refused. In fact, they even went as far as warning Jamestown of the attack that would have rid Virginia of European presence as we know it today. So, in fact, we actually snitched. In fact, we actually snitched. We snitched on our own people. Or maybe that was their enemies, right? They wanted their land too or something. I don't know what did the history, why they did it. And these people who are descendants, and these are black folks. There's a black lady, you know, so-called black. Right. And, um, you know, this is <laughs> she came at me, guys. I'm telling you, she came at me and I'm not going to say her name or anything like that. People know who I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, she came at me very rudely, like very, very rudely to my comments and stuff because because of the black European videos. And I had never even talked to her. I have never said anything about her or anything personal. I don't even know the lady. But the more I keep researching and learning, like I said before, guys, sometimes it's in the nature of people, the way they act because they carry a certain ancestry. They carry this, let's help the colonists. Let's, let's be like the colonists ancestry. In addition, the Akamakis fed and closed the colonists. The Europeans need and depletion of the Virginia Bay Indians food stores was devastating. Conversely, the Akamakis had more plentiful resources than their cousins on the Bay side. And so because they were helping, they were helping the settlers, right? They had more resources than the rest of the tribes. 
oh here they sold out there's no other way for me to say this unfortunately generosity of the akamaki indians was no match for the greed of european london company so eventually they got dealt wrong too and that's what happens when you deal with the enemy it's gonna bite you back all right so i'll leave it at that let's go back to the book i just wanted to show you an example of treaty making indians when i'm saying that because i want to again show you what happened to the nansaticos who were not letting these settlers take their land who were trying to fight to survive and feed their families and keep their prehistoric land they were there up to 10,000 years ago come on now so continuing in the book the assembly considered the nansaticos case in May 1705 the council and the house of burgesses deferring over what degree of guilt could be laid to the indians charge the burgesses took the view that the indians were most likely guilty of complicity in the murders and should be removed from the colony uh most likely right guys most likely they were probably guilty uh in the murder too and uh they're probably gonna do it or you know we should just remove them from the colony I wonder what the Akamaki said about that. All those above the age of 12 whom they regarded as most dangerous should be transported to England or the West Indies sold as servants for seven years and barred on pain of death from ever returning to Virginia. Do you guys hear that? They got sold into slavery. And of course, they're even telling you the drop. It was actually indentured servitude. Seven years. What happened after seven years? They were free, but they couldn't return to Virginia. They got barred. If they got caught coming back, they would be killed. So the Nanciaticos, because they were just trying to keep their land, protect the remaining members of their tribe, which was already very low from what I'm assuming the settlers did to them, because these people were warriors. We heard in the beginning, 150 warriors, and all of a sudden they had only 50 people. That doesn't mean they were all warriors. There was women, children, and everything in that. Where's the warriors? They probably had died trying to survive and fight these settlers while the Akamaki are helping, right? We even went out of our way to snitch on the Pamunki. We're the friendliest Indians ever in history. I mean, come on. So again, all the tribal members who were 12 years of age or older got transported out into slavery, guys. Sold as servants to the West Indies and England. Those children who were under 12 should be bound out amongst the English, all right? They were bound out, meaning the children were made servants or bounded, right? Indentured. And they were bound out to these people, these so-called English amongst, right? So-called English. A lot of these so-called English are actually crypto Jews, crypto Muslims. Yes, we've gone over the information. Let's not forget the previous drop. Let's talk truth and facts here. No matter feelings and emotions, guys. We got to take the good and the bad to understand true history. It's in the past. So these children were bound out to the settlers, you know, while they're uh, older family members, parents, and guardians were sent out of the colony into slavery. And they had to serve them until the age of 24 and never return to the Rappahannock River to live in another Indian town, all right? Genocide, okay? Look what they did to the Nansaticos. So they had to do an indenture till they were 24, 25. That's a lot of years. And that was common with children under indenture servitude. We've read this in the videos I showed you guys uh, earlier. So make sure to get those videos. So you guys can see the full, the full history of, of Indian slavery. The, real, the true slavery, so-called slavery, right? True slavery here. So these children were bound out all those years, right? All those years. So of course, they're going to say, oh, Oh, yeah, he was a slave, and then he was freed by his master. So you see, a lot of the time, it's not that they were freed. It's just that their indenture was over. Of course they were freed. That was already the, that was already set when they got bounded out. 
they were to be freed when they were 24 and 25, not because their master wanted to, uh, you know, free them just because, and these were African slaves. You guys understand, you got to put all, all of this into perspective. So you got to understand what really was going down. So they weren't even able to return to their ancient homeland. It's psychological. You know, they want to make sure they killed the Indian, remember? Got to kill the Indian out of you. Take the Indian out of you. In its treatment of the Indians, the House of Burgesses proved harsher than the council. Members of the council tried to save some of the elderly from transportation. They proposed to exclude an old Indian man, Maddox Will. That's his name, Maddox Will, and his wife, Betty, right? And attempted to set both free. They also proposed that most of the women and girls be sold not in the West Indies, but on the eastern shore of Virginia. The House of Burgesses, however, was adamant. All the adults must go, and the council ultimately agreed to the demand. Arrangements were made with Sea Captain John Martin. All right, Martin. Again, we've gone over who these peoples are based on their name <laughs> and their history, their ethnicity, for the expulsion of the Indians from Virginia. Subsequently, the members of the council divided up the 13 young children of the Nanciaticos among themselves by casting lots for them. You hear that? Casting lots for them, just like in scripture. Governor Francis Nicholson took four children and the other members of the council, one each. Four of these children were between nine and 18 months old. Wow. These were babies. In May of 1706, 21 months after the murders, the council received a letter from John Jemans, Lieutenant Governor of Antigua in the Leeward Islands, confirming the arrival and sale of the Nancia Tico Indians. All right? This was where they were sent to Antigua, to the Caribbean, you know? And guess what they told us, guys, in history? that they were bringing so-called Negroes from Africa into Antigua, right? Are well, we going to see who the descendants of the uh, Nansa Tico are today? I'm going to show you guys. So they were being sent to Antigua, right, to the Caribbean, the small West Indian island of sugar and slaves was to be their place of permanent exile to a sugar plantation American Indians, Nansiatico Indians, because they didn't want to make treaties and let these settlers just take their land and do whatever they wanted, they got exiled. They got sent as slaves to the sugar plantations. This is real history, not false African narratives. What became of them there is unknown. All right, what happened to them there? Let me guess, they became Negroes, right? You guys know that, right? You, you This... That's what they tell us in history. What what Nanciatico Indians, they never told us about this in school. They told us they were sending Africans to Antigua. You know what I'm talking about, professors. Some probably did not survive long. Others may have left descendants. Oh, others may have left descendants. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't think a lot of the people in Antigua are Nanciatico Indians? Well, they are. How can one explain? so fearful a retribution. Once the men of the tribe had been duly executed for murder, was it really necessary to insist on the removal of surviving members of the tribe? Like, that's a good question. Nearly all of them old men, women and children. Do you hear that? Their warriors, most of their warriors were already dead. It was just old men, women and children. Why would they need to send these people away? They weren't going to do no rebe rebellion and kill all the settlers. You guys got to understand, they got they wanted to get rid of these people right away because they weren't going down with the treaties. They weren't going down. They weren't helping like the Akamaki. They weren't down like the Akamaki. Uh-uh, they weren't going to sell out. So they knew these people carried a, a, a spirit of resistance. They were warriors. Not since the time of Bacon's Rebellion, 30 years earlier, had the Indians posed a real threat to the security of Virginia. Certainly the old resentments and fears. The legacy of almost a century of contact between Indians and settlers remained powerful. Indian massacres were part of the history and folklore of the colony. Despite the numerical strength the settlers enjoyed over the Indians at the beginning of the 18th century, 
the colonial government was still wary of Indian activities. Just prior to the Richmond County murders in spring 1704, authorities in Williamsburg had refused permission for representatives from a number of Virginia tribes, among them the Nanciaticos, to go north out of the colony to conclude a peace with the Seneca Indians and secure the release of one of their number, a king of the Nottoways. The murder of the Rowley family had invoked all the negative aspects of the colonial image of the Indian as a pagan, savage, treacherous, and vengeful, and if the ritualistic savagery of the murders confirmed settlers' worst expectations of Indians, the Nanciaticos were particularly vulnerable at this time because they had been associating with two of the tribes that had recently harassed the colony, the Piscataways and the Tweetis. I never heard of the Tweetis. Piscataway Indians crossed over from Maryland in 1697 and settled along the Potomac River within the boundaries of Stafford County. They were not welcome. Later that year, five of these same Indians faced charges of wounding a woman and three of her children, and one of them was hanged for the assault. It was also generally believed they were responsible for killing a family of five and three neighboring children in 1700, an atrocity that George Mason of Stafford described as the most horrifying ever to have occurred in that county. The Piscataways denied all responsibility for the murders and blamed them on the distant Twig T Indians. Do you hear that? It was the Nancia Tico Indians who had played a leading role in promoting efforts among other Virginia Indian tribes to obtain a treaty with the Witwe Indians. The colonial government had dissuaded them from the alliance, but these connections gave the Nancia Tico Indians a significance that was to prove disastrous to them. The elaborate court set up in Richmond County in 1704 was designed not only to try certain Nanciatico Indians for the crime of murder, but to provide an object lesson to the other Virginia Indians summoned to the trial as of service of the consequences of collusion with hostile non-Virginia Indians. The forced dispersal of the tribe by the assembly repeated the lesson and met the wishes of inhabitants of the upper Rappahannock River, who had petitioned the assembly to transport the Nanciaticos out of Virginia. The Virginia General Assembly justified its actions by claiming that the Indians were a people of revengeful temper, never forgetting what they apprehend to be injuries. By the same token, it tacitly acknowledged the severity of its own response. For the settlers of Richmond County, its neighboring counties, and the government of Virginia, it was easier to destroy the Nanciatico Indians than to live with them, all right? It's much easier to just destroy them and get rid of them. They're not like the Akamaki Indians. They ain't trying to help us, all right? So that actually is the end of this uh, article here in this book. As you guys can see, it goes into another chapter here. But I just wanted to go ahead and read this and show you guys uh, some of these images they're showing here real quick. So they got this image right here, of course, you know, this is very bad copy, the Xerox. Says here, digging on rather hoeing the cane hose from 10 views on the island of Antigua. All right, this is Antigua, all right? What do you see here, guys? All so-called Negroes, right? But what I want to show you is this one right here is one of the overseers. He's also so-called Negro. He is one of the overseers. So where's the Indians, right? Where's the Indians, right? <laughs> Look what they're showing you guys. You see? Who were the Nanciatico Indians? So again, sold into slavery in retribution against the Nanciatico Indians. So real quick, we're in genealogy, social, genealogywise.com. What is this about? It says here, my Virginia native ancestors, Huico Mico and Nanciatico. Who's saying that? Anita Wills. This is Anita Wills, guys. She's direct descendant of the Nansatico Indians, and not just the Indians. When you actually study her history, she has a lot of books. She's a genealogist, she's been doing it for a while, even though there may still be some confusion into the whole African narratives that she was told. That's why she's so-called black. 
but she knows almost all her Indian ancestry. She descends from many, many tribes, many tribes, and she has written many books for you guys to see that I'm not making it up. This is one of them. We are the Minkwa or the Black Minkwa. So again, this is her right here. And what is she telling us, guys? My Virginia native ancestors, Nansa Tico, Nansa Tico. This past September 2017, I traveled to Virginia and stood on the homeland of my Nansa Tico Indian ancestors, right? My Nansa Tico Indian ancestors, her ancestors. Do you guys remember who you are? What Africans? What Africans? Prove the African part first. Because you can prove the Indian part. You have proven it. You have done the genealogy and found that out. But there is no so-called Africans in there. Not like how we imagine. Not like how we imagine. Not from West Africa being brought in slave ships. That's all a false narrative. She's telling us they lived along the Rappahannock for thousands of years before colonization. She knew her history. She said, my people have been there for thousands of years. That's my people. That's my people. They've been there for thousands of years. Do you remember who you are? My ancestors, Charles and Ambrose Lewis, were the sons of Indian Charles, who was a member of the tribe, okay? He was a member of the tribe. She knows her ancestors. She's done her genealogy. She ain't trying to be spitting on no two. The homeland of the Nansa Tico is in King George and Caroline County along the Rappahannock in Virginia. In 1704, several members of the Nansa Tico were accused of killing a white family. They were accused, so-called white, so-called white. That had encroached on their land they were tried by the colonial government found guilty and hanged but that was not enough a decision was made to ship the remaining adult members of the tribe to antigua as slaves again ship the remaining adult members of the tribe to antigua as slaves my ancestor indian charles was about five years old and any children under 14 were spared do you guys hear that because he was a child he was able to stay there if not, she would have had a whole different history. Possibly might not even have been here. All right? That's deep right there. The adults were shipped to Antigua and never heard from again. The children were indentured out to plantation owners for 25 years, and their racial status would change to mulatto. Again, to what? To mulatto. Who? Indians. Indians. 100% full-blood Indians being classified as mulatto who's telling you this a direct descendant she's done the work she knows her genealogy she knows the history guys they were changed racially they were declassified they got tagged mulatto paper genocide paper genocide my non-satico ancestor charles lewis and his brother ambrose were indentured out to john lewis along with their father all right so they kind of had the same last name so to me what does that mean huh oh they got their name from him huh the brothers served as seamen and soldiers out of Fredericksburg during the revolutionary war during the revolutionary war and i bet you we have their name in my book that we've done you know uh virginia's colonial soldiers you guys remember those videos make sure to check that out too there's three parts of that we've proven that most of the uh revolutionary war soldiers in virginia were actually so-called black i would say 95 percent of them or more we we showed you the descriptions of how these people were being described you know like dark complexion swarthy so-called black brown you know all right all right so again we're gonna leave it there hope you guys enjoyed uh this presentation let's not forget about the non uh indigenous people of Virginia and what happened to them. And again, who they became, they became so-called slaves in Antigua and mulattoes in Virginia, colored folks, so-called black. Let's not forget, because she has not forgotten. She remembers, and look at that. That could be your grandma right there, telling you the story that you never paid attention to. Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great weekend. Wow.